Welcome to our presentation on water testing methods. My name is Kazu Chinda, and I'm currently a freshman at Harvard thinking about studying biomedical engineering. And I'm Alejandro Gracia John, and I'm a sophomore currently studying mechanical engineering. The first big question is why do we test water in different regions? And there's two main categories, medical reasons and practical. Under medical reasons, bad water sources can lead to diseases and organ damage. And under practical reasons, even if the water isn't causing medical problems, if there's qualities such as high hardness in the water, it can lead to a bad taste or an off color, which prevents individuals from wanting to drink it. Also, with certain contaminants such as E. coli, their presence can indicate that there's contamination sources, such as agricultural waste or human waste, and those are avoidable if you know that they're present. The World Health Organization estimates that about 840 to 100,000 people die every year from diarrhea due to unsafe drinking water, and this is a preventable problem. So first, we want to look at the main contaminants, um, the contaminants found in uh, water sources. So we want to know what are these contaminants and where do they come from? There are three main types of contaminants that we will cover. So the first contaminants we are going to talk about are the primary contaminants. The EPA has established national primary drinking water regulations, and these set a mandatory water quality standard for uh, drinking water contaminants. So these are enforceable standards in the United States. And these Primary contaminants are uh, the main contaminants that pose a risk to human health. So the first one of these contaminants we're going to talk about are the chemical contaminants. For chemical contaminants, uh, we have ammonia, nitrate, nitrite, phosphate, and we also have the heavy metals, such as arsenic, lead, mercury, cadmium, and chromium. The heavy metals mostly come off come from industrial runoff, whereas the three chemicals on the left side are mainly from agricultural runoff. However, arsenic can also occur naturally, so this is why whenever we are testing water, even if the area is not near any industrial activity, we should still test for arsenic. And finally, we need to also test for chlorine. So this is after the water has been treated to disinfect the water. We want a certain level of chlorine because without chlorine, bacteria may be growing in the water. However, if the chlorine is too high, this can also pose uh, health effects. The second contaminant is uh, from soil. So these include hardness, alkalinity, pH, total dissolved solids, total su suspended solids, turbidity, and salinity. So the sources for these come from mainly from soil composition and rock formation. Next, we have the biological contaminants. These include parasites, insect larvae, coliform bacteria, fecal coliform bacteria, and E. coli. So we should note here that coliform bacteria is actually uh, naturally occurring in the environment. However, fecal coliform bacteria comes from either human waste or animal waste. So this is, an, this is an indicator that the water has been contaminated by human or animal waste, and there may be other contaminants in the water that should be tested for. For the second portion of our presentation, we're going to cover testing methods. So after we've discussed these contaminants, how do we identify and quantify how much of them are actually in water sources? There are a couple different things to keep in mind when you're collecting samples. Under general tips, you should always sample from what you expect to be the cleanest sites first if you're sampling from a variety of different locations. So if you're sampling from a water collection system and a body of water, for example, you should sample from the water collection system first, because if your equipment gets contaminated from the lake or the river, then that could carry over and skew your results. You should also make sure to collect living contaminants last, such as bacteria, if you're collecting a variety of different sample types, since those usually need to be incubated. Avoid contamination at as many points as you can, which means disinfect your sampling point, the spigot on the water collection system, or disinfect your containers if you're collecting from a body of water. 
and don't touch the inside of the container or the cap since that can also skew your results. If you're collecting from natural bodies of water, you should look for uniform unidirectional flow whenever possible because if there's eddies or other turbulence in the water, that can stir up debris from the bottom and again skew your results. And avoid point sources of contamination because those can introduce uh, contaminants which you wouldn't otherwise detect. Always sample upstream of man-made structures such as bridges because those can leach chemicals into the water, again, skewing your results. And finally, when you're sampling from wells, there's a couple special things to note. Measure the water level in advance because you need to remove three or more well volumes of standing water before testing, and that's called purging. The problem with wells is that over time, atmospheric contaminants can get inside, and if you test the water that's been sitting in there for a while, then those contaminants will show up in your results. And so you want to purge the well and remove that water so that you're sampling water directly from the aquifer into the water that may have been contaminated. And don't sample from wells that are excessively shallow because again, that can stir up contaminants. There's a variety of different tests that you can do during trips, but there's three main limiting factors. Some of them require a very large setup. Some of them are just not worth doing and other ones take a lot of time. And so we really have to focus on the tests that are in the middle, that we do have the setup and resources for while in country that are important and will give us relevant information and that won't take an excessively long time. The first source of contamination that we test for is chemicals. And that's because again, these can lead to a variety of health complications when ingested. We test for chemicals using test strips. And the basic premise is you take the strip, dip it in the sample, and after a few minutes, you compare the color that the strip has changed against a chart. Hotch has some five-in-one test strips, which can cover free chlorine, total chlorine, pH, and some things from the next slide. And they also have individual test strips for a variety of different chemicals. To test for soil contaminants, you can use test strips. Um, as mentioned from the previous slide, Hotch's five-in-one cover alkalinity and hardness. Um, and you can also use individual test strips for things such as salinity. Another useful piece of equipment is a turbidity tube, which allows you to measure turbidity or how many suspended solids are in the water. It's best to think of this as the water's murkiness. And so you use a graduated tube, which has a mark at the very bottom, and you pour in water continuously until you can no longer see the mark at the bottom. If it's very murky water, then by the time that you've reached the 300 line, for example, you might not be able to see the X at the bottom, but if it's crystal clear, you can fill the tube up almost all the way without um, losing sight of the mark. And these are a variety of common contaminants that we've tested for in the path. It might be a good idea to print this table out. Um, most of these are agricultural contaminants, such as ammonia, nitrate, phosphate, um, and if you're in an agricultural area or doing an agricultural related project, you should make sure to test for these. Um, as noted earlier, if you're in an industrial area, you might want to test for heavy metals instead. And if it's anything to do with drinking water, biological is always a very good idea. This table lists the acceptable results for all the different contaminants and some potential sources. So as you can see, most of them come from manure, fertilizer, sewage, things resulted to agriculture, but hardness comes from soil composition. And while it won't cause any health effects, it's important to know that the taste of the water will be influenced by that. And so community members might not want to drink it. Um, you can feel free to look at the remainder of the table for specific health effects of different compounds. This table is on secondary max contaminant levels. Secondary contaminant levels as listed by the EPA are not crucial to test for since they do not cause significant health effects. However, it is recommended that you test for these because these contaminants can lead to changes in the aesthetic quality of the water. So this includes changing the taste of the water or changing how the water looks or how the water smells. Examples of contaminants uh, that change the color are aluminum um, or copper or iron. And there are also other contaminants that can change the taste such as chloride, fluoride or ion or even uh, sulfate. And there are also um, other contaminants, um, but all of these change the aesthetic quality and can make the water very unpleasant, uh, especially if you are going to be drinking this water. 
Next, I want to talk about microbial contamin contamination. So we mentioned this earlier, but just to review, uh, microbial contamination uh, includes pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, and parasites. And all of these can cause a wide range of health problems. Um, a main microbial contamination is coliform bacteria. So coliform bacteria does not always cause illness. However, um, the presence of coliform bacteria usually is a very good indicator that the water has come into contact with uh, animal waste or with human waste. And because the water has come into contact with these contaminants, it's an indicator that there may be many other uh, microbial contaminants that might cause more uh, serious health risks. So just a side note, along with measuring for coliform bacteria, as mentioned earlier, you should also measure for turbidity because uh, pathogens can be absorbed into suspended particles and this might shield them from disinfection. So um, along with measuring microbial contamination, you should also measure for turbidity and if you disinfect the water after disinfecting it, again, test for the chlorine levels. Um, so it's impractical to analyze water for every individual pathogen, every individual uh, possible microbial contaminant. So this is why we either look at um, some main contaminant like E. coli, or we look at an indicator species such as fecal coliform bacteria. So for measuring coliform bacteria, there are some uh, more accurate methods such as multiple tube fermentation or membrane filtration methods. Um, I've listed some on the left, but all of these, uh, at least for a portable kit, because they require uh, very specialized incubators and tubes, um, even the cheaper models can cost around $2,000. So an, a cheaper but more specific, uh, more limited test is to test for E. coli with uh, plates. So for this, we would um, add, we would take a small amount of water, possibly 100 milliliters, and switch it around the disc and then incubate at around body temperature for one to two days. And then afterwards, we would count the colonies per this 100 milliliters of water. And we have listed in the table in the square um, the different amounts of colonies and what they indicate. Another simple test is the hydrogen sulfide test. So this test is uh, provides a qualitative result. So by using this test, we can uh, find out if the water uh, contains uh, contains coliform bacteria. Although it won't tell us exactly what the levels of coliform bacteria are, it's a very simple test for finding out if there is this bacteria. And if there is, this indicates that there may be other uh, more serious contaminants than we should test for later on. So the test procedure is fairly simple. Um, because many of these bacteria uh, lead to hydrogen sulfide production, um, this hydrogen sulfide uh, when mixed in with iron forms a black iron sulfide precipitate. So basically for this test, we are uh, adding our water sample into a bottle and then adding the iron pellets. And after swishing it around and letting it incubate, um, and also note that the incubator doesn't have to be that precise. It is uh, all we need to do is to make sure that the water stays fairly warm around 25 to 30 degrees Celsius for one to two days. And then after this period, we can uh, look at the water and see how black it has become uh, due to the hydrogen sulfide reacting with the iron. And this will give us an indication of uh, if, if, there is, uh, coliform bac if there is bacteria and we can have an estimation of how much there is. And now we're going to cover some key takeaways from our water testing presentation. The first main takeaway is that we do not test for everything. We don't have the time or the resources while in country. So we have to predict likely contaminants that we might encounter and prepare accordingly. So for example, Los Sanchez is a largely agricultural community. And so it makes sense to test for things like ammonium instead of things like heavy metals, which are mainly found in industrial runoff. Nevertheless, arsenic is an important thing to test for because it's naturally occurring. 
And so you really have to keep what contaminants the community might face in mind when you're preparing to travel. So this is a table of some things that we have tested for in the past. As you can see, the vast majority of them are done using test strips, which are mainly procured from Hotch, and we've included the product numbers to the right so that you can use the same materials if you'd like. Um, but there's a couple of exceptions that I'm going to touch on. Arsenic is done using test strips, but it also requires a reagent because you aren't testing for the arsenic directly. It's reacting with mercury, and the product of that is being tested with the test strips. Hardness through pH, as we mentioned earlier, can be tested using the 5-in-1 test strips, but total dissolved solids is done a little bit differently. It can be tested one of two different ways, using a conductivity meter or gravimetrically. Gravimetrically involves the use of filter paper, and so you saturate the paper using water from your source, and you record the change in mass from the paper by itself versus after it's dried out. But that requires a precise scale, and you also have to store that piece of filter paper somewhere while it's drying. And so in a lot of cases, it makes more sense to bring along a conductivity meter. And that's a probe that you can insert into a water sample, and it'll send out a charge. And based on how much it receives back, that tells you how many ions are in the water, and you can estimate the total dissolved solid straight off the meter. And finally, as you mentioned before, E. coli is done using a Petri dish, which you can get from 3M. Again, the product number is included and you swish around 100 milliliters of water and you count the number of dark blue and purple colonies to determine the number of bacterial colonies in the water. Well, for example, these are some tests that we might want to use for our projects this year. Microbial tests can be very useful. Um, as we mentioned earlier, you can incubate samples in country and that's useful when you're designing a system because if you're moving water around or working with drinking water, you want to make sure that there aren't living contaminants inside of your water storage vessels, et cetera. Um, if you're doing something involving filtration, you can test for turbidity or total dissolved solids because um, if you're collecting water from a roof, for example, and storing it in a tank, um, and you're using a first flush filtration system, turbidity allows you to determine how many of those contaminants are getting past your filtration system and into your tank and total dissolved solids lets you know how many of those contaminants are just getting washed off of a roof, for example, and getting into your tank. Iron's another useful test to do if you're determining runoff from a roof, because again, while it isn't a health hazard, it can affect the water taste and allow bacteria to grow. Finally, we need to understand that these methods we covered just now, we are uh, currently using quite a few of them in our project, in the team's projects in Los Sanchez and Mukutani, but these methods are also extendable. These can be used in many different areas around the world, especially areas that uh, lack sources of clean water or um, are suffering from different, are suffering from droughts. So this is, these, um, uh, these methods are very useful for uh, testing if the water is suitable for drinking and for avoiding other adverse health problems. And finally, water should be clean no matter how it gets collected. And water should be clean no matter how it gets piped. And water should be clean no matter where it gets stored. And finally, water should be clean no matter where it comes from. Testing for water is very important because water testing lets us make sure that water stays that way. It lets us make sure that it stays clean. We'd like to say thank you to all of these different sources for the background material that we use. And if you have any questions, feel free to submit them to us at harvardbwd.org. Thank you.